Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Andrew Henderson. I'm the Managing Director of Jitterbit for Asia Pacific. Thanks for joining across the region. I've noticed there's people in India and Singapore and uh, Australia and New Zealand. So across your, uh, I would think, afternoon, but some people morning, welcome. Um, thanks for coming uh, to learn a bit about eBridge, um, an acquisition that Jitterbit made uh, a couple of months ago now, and we finally got all the technology stood up in our local data centres. So it's an exciting time to be launching a product that addresses all the sovereignty and so forth that um, is now domiciled in region. Um, I'd just like to, I've been with the business for six years. Um, it's a terrific team. Um, been working uh, basically from South Korea down to New Zealand. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a background on Jitterbit and then I'll hand to my eBridge colleagues who have kindly stayed up late out of Canada tonight to do this presentation. Um, we, we've been around for quite some time now, since 2004, and predominantly grown out of um, the Salesforce ecosystem, which is testament to the fact we have roughly 60,000 data loader users on the Salesforce ecosystem. What we're here to talk about today, though, is, is eBridge and Harmony, and Harmony is our commercial product. Um, I noticed from the attendees, some of you are already uh, familiar with this. Um, we, we're about 250, I want to say, uh, employees globally. Um, with the inclusion of eBridge, I think that adds another 60 or 70. So uh, we're growing very quickly. We have about 300 partners around the world. And I want to say about 80, 80 or so in the region. Um, our alliances with, with various vendors around the world uh, include the likes of Salesforce and NetSuite and, and global system integrators from a partnership perspective you know, at the top end type of Accentures, all the way through to boutique integration specialists. A large number of our customers come from the APAC region today, and I think we make up what is now a considerable um, component of GDB globally. Um, our focus has generally been in the mid-market. We do have enterprise customers, and we continue to, to march towards um, enterprise as a, as a market for us. But our platform is really designed to cater for any type of scale our growth in the last couple of years has really taken off and it's been largely as a result of, of COVID driving the need to, to start to have um, obviously integration when people have shifted from office scenarios to, to an at-home environment, it obviously created system pressures and we've seen growth as a result of that. Um, a lot of organisations are really looking at how do we integrate what exists from an on-prem perspective, putting behind your firewall, all the way through to what's happening in the SaaS world, where the likes of Salesforce is becoming um, very much part of integral of your business process, and any third-party data centers. So regardless of where your data resides, our distributed architecture allows us to connect to that, look inside it, uh, move data around, and basically wrap your business processes up to, to automate. Um, <clears throat> we're pretty proud of the fact that we, we have a, uh, a very eclectic but strong group of investors, and I mean that from the point of view of Samsung, Electronics, all the way through the likes of Salesforce, KKR, and more recently, Audax out of Boston have come on and, and taken a stake in the company. Um, you will find also that um, from a customer satisfaction perspective, GDB has been rated number one for customer sat through G2 Crowd. For those that are familiar, it's basically a crowd-based ratings um, site, and we've been number one in that for several quarters um, I want to say about eight now. We've also been a Gartner Magic Quadrant leader uh, for five years, and we're pretty proud of that accolade. We, we recently, <clears throat> as part of the acquisition of eBridge, really looking to fulfil a niche around how do we better serve EDI and how we get EDI, e-commerce, ERP and CRM systems humming. Um, so I'm very pleased to be able to hand over to Dave Mulder, who's our v VP of eBridge Sales, and Lindsay Hampson, who is the VP of eBridge Marketing today, to take you through eBridge and the platform. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, um, Andrew. Thanks. Dave, do you want to uh, give a little little yeah, background about sure. yourself for a few seconds? Absolutely, yeah. So nice to meet you, uh, everybody. It's uh, We're very excited, obviously, to do this and to share uh, you know, what we know um, about EDI. Um, myself, I've been with eBridge for about 12 years, maybe 12 and a half years. 
um, you know, all the way from really just doing EDI specifically, but then branching off into uh, e-commerce and Salesforce and some other uh, point of sale systems over time. Um, my role there uh, today involves hunting new business, uh, primarily in North America with, uh, we have six territories and uh, probably about 16 people uh, on the team, uh, you know, actively selling and hunting. So nice to meet you all. Great. And uh, I'm Lindsay Hampson. I'm the VP of Marketing. I've been uh, with eBridge, now Jitterbit, for uh, for five years now. And um, all things marketing and partnerships. And I even got to work with some of our current customers through our account management and expansion team. Um, and just a little sidebar, I lived in Australia for, for a while. Um, and so I'm, I'm missing the weather, and I definitely miss the Tim Tams, if that, uh, <laughs> that rings a bell. <laughs> All right, so let's let's get going. Thanks again for having us, by the way. So uh, my job is the fun job. I get to set the scene about why um, eBridge um, was in a position to be acquired by um, Jitterbit. And that is because obviously there was this amazing shift in commerce over the last um, almost two years now. Obviously, we all knew that online sales would become something. Um, but I think with the, the dawn of COVID, everybody went online much quicker. And so the e-commerce, um, the e-commerce world boomed, and we people had to move their technology onto marketplaces, onto carts. They had to figure out how they could do curbside, uh, and so the whole world changed, and along with it, technology changed too. And uh, eBridge has been around for a bit. Dave's going to talk about eBridge in a, in a slide or two, um, but we're experts at EDI, which we'll get into, and also e-commerce. And so it was kind of a, a funny time for Dave and I where we were really busy. Uh, mm -hmm. And so our domain expertise really absolutely paid off. So we're super excited to be part of the Jitterbit family and excited to help uh, customers and prospects in, in Asia-Pac. All right, Dave, why don't you uh, walk through eBridge for everyone? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. So uh, as you can see on the slide here, so I'll just maybe step back a, a bunch of years, but uh, our, our CEO, former CEO and founder, Colin Brown, uh, founded the company in, in 1993. Um, it, we primarily started as a, we were an EDI company and we were integrating into, uh, at the time it was called ACPAC. Um, you know, we were one of the first companies to build out a partner program with them and to work really closely with them before it was acquired by uh, Sage and, and, and became a, a different Sage product. But um, over those years, we developed, like I mentioned, um, uh, e-commerce connectors. We continued to build out and deploy EDI uh, for big box stores and suppliers. Uh, and then we also just really went deep on uh, you know, things like Shopify, Magento, uh, Big Commerce, which I know you're all familiar with. So we really became uh, experts in uh, the different integrations uh, that were required, um, whether it was EDI or e-commerce or, or CRM. So lots of expertise, uh, I would say, long tenured employees. Um, I'm probably one of, you know, I guess a few that have been there for 12 years, but there's a bunch that have been there for you know 15 and 20 plus years. So uh, a lot of expertise, a lot of expertise in EDI uh, with a lot of the long tenured employees. Uh, so right now, as Andrew mentioned, we're around you know 80 employees. Uh, we've got about 900 customers uh, currently on our platform, and then um, we've also built out um, you know channel partners and alliances with uh, some of the key tech partners and whatnot in our ecosystem. So we're we're sort of sitting, we sit really in the middle of a fairly large ecosystem and we play quite an active uh, role in it as well, so. Great. So uh, we have a, a lot of customers doing a lot of different things. A, a few of the customers that eBridge um, got as one of the first, when you know, a one or two or three, we still have as customers today. Um, but some of the, the global brands that we're super proud of, uh, one of them is Everlast, the boxing glove company, uh, Timbuktu, they make backpacks out of San Francisco. And you can see that these are diverse brands that have sophisticated systems behind the scenes um, in their back office. And they're obviously doing pretty cool things online to try and get their brands out. So um, 
you know, we, we cover the gamut. Some of these, some of these brands only do e-commerce integrations with us and some of them do only EDI integrations and some of them do both. And, uh, some of them have been through a, free, a few transformations with us. So potentially they had, let's say, um, QuickBooks as their ERP. And then as they grew, they moved over to NetSuite or they moved over to SAP Business One. So um, we've we've definitely worked with some cool brands before. And, and honestly, data is the lifeblood of their business. And so when they trust us, we, we obviously feel pretty honored. I think too, Lindsay, an, an important point there is each one of them came to us with a specific need. So I know in the case of Everlast, it was, let's say, a Magento Enterprise integration, but then turned into Amazon and some, you know, in-store sales and uh, maybe even some point-of-sale offerings. And, and I, I can go through, I recall uh, winning each of these customers as well, and I know a lot of them started with one thing, whether it was EDI or maybe online, and, and really grew with eBridge as they kind of went through their their plans to, you know, um, attack the market, right? So it was great for us to be able to sit in the middle and just keep adding on pieces. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. All right, and just uh, just wanted to cover one company. They're called Gourmet Settings and they make uh, cutlery that you would buy at Costco, for example. And so what we do, we do a few things for them, but just let's talk about EDI for a second. Um, so what they need from us is obviously they have to comply with some EDI standards for a big box retailer um, and Costco, for example. And so every single time that Costco orders something from gourmet settings, they need to send an 850 order. And that 850, all of that information in that document has to get back to their back office system, which is SAP Business One. And so we automate that workflow, that order from Costco to SAP Business One. We also automate uh, invoices from SAP Business One back over to Costco. And so those are two examples of workflows. We'll get into a few others, but that is what we automate for, for them. And that's just for one trading partner. And so the, the, the diagram or the, the graphic on the bottom of this slide is all kinds of different trading partners that we help them with and also marketplaces and also e-commerce carts. So really the sky's the limit. You can keep adding on to your integration with eBridge and, and that's what we do for gourmet settings. All right, I'm gonna try and make the description of what EDI is fun <laughs> because <laughs> I, think, uh, I think some of you on the line are familiar and some of you, this might be a brand new term. Um, so EDI is electronic data interchange, but really what you need to know is this is a, a data or a language uh, that needs to go from a supplier to a trading partner. And it, it began many years ago, it's been around for, for decades, and it replaced paper. So somebody used to take a physical piece of paper to a big box retailer or vice versa, back and forth about an order. So we're, we need to order 10 skids of a certain product. And the company would acknowledge, yes, I see that you want those 10 skids. They're being sent tomorrow on this shipment. And all that information would have been passed manually via paper. But then came the dawn of EDI, which is this electronic means of communication. And so each retailer standardized. So Costco's EDI requirements are slightly different than another big box retailer. And so that's where the complexity comes in for people that are just starting out or businesses that have multiple trading partners it gets complicated. Um, so, but if you're supplying to one of these big box retailers, you have to do it. Uh, so that is definitely the conundrum for a lot of firms or, or companies that are growing. And so where to start? We just kind of boil it down into three things. Find out after you've been approved to supply at a big box retailer, what is required? We call it the imp guide or the implementation guide. So what are all the documents and the EDI that I need to send you? And then what systems will you need to communicate to back and forth? That's when Dave, for example, would help you identify what ERP you're using. SAP Business One, great. And you're trading with Costco, great. And then you would do some setup and you would pass testing. 
So it sounds complicated, but it's really just a couple of steps. And we've been doing this for a long, long time now. So, so we can help. All right, Dave, I'm going to pass it over and I want you to dive a little yeah. deeper into, into eBird sure. DDI. Sure. Yeah, no problem. And I, and I know one of our most popular YouTube videos, I think on our channel is what is EDI? So uh, you can, you know, people go to Google when they are required to do EDI and they do a search and I guess clearly that video shows up. But uh, if you're wondering what it is, uh, apparently a lot of other people are too. So um, just a quick slide on, on, you know, EDI integrations with eBridge. Um, it, it does come with a, a bunch of things. And I, I really think that uh, the acquisition uh, by Jitterbit, um, you know, is such an important key one because of the EDI expertise that we have. Um, there's a bullet point there that, it men that mentions the domain expertise. And uh, certainly uh, we have folks that are very well tenured, um, you know, on the service side of the business. So we have uh, several teams that we have built out that help deploy um, some of these complex integrations. And we try to manage uh, all of these services so that the client really has to maybe deal with, let's say, Costco or a big box retailer on a certain level, maybe for some, um, you know, some, some questions around maybe their contract or uh, some other things that they may need to do for, um, uh, you know, any answers they may have around product and things like that. But eBridge really takes all of the the minutia of the testing and where does this field go into your, let's say, NetSuite or SAP Business One. We, we handle all of that. So that really does take a, a big load off of, um, you know, the person that may be overwhelmed trying to implement this. As you go through and implement more trading partners, it does get a little easier, but eBridge is meant to come in and really help with that. So that's one thing that we really bring. I think also the um, uh, the, the preferred Commerce Hub partnership uh, really does allow us to compete with some of the other big, um, you know, EDI uh, companies out there, like say an SPS Commerce or uh, True Commerce. There's a, there's a bunch of them out there that we will come up against routinely. And us being a preferred Commerce Hub partner in the drop shipping uh, world really helps us. Um, maybe a couple more points here where we can win uh, on certain deals is we have unlimited uh, transaction volumes. So that means that as you uh, will see success, right? So uh, let's say your orders are going from maybe a hundred a month to a couple of thousand uh, a month in your peak times, um, your rate would stay flat. And that has been something that has helped us uh, over the years as well. Um, I think that's kind of it, Lindsay. I don't know if there's maybe anything else that you can plug in there, but I think those are kind of the key points, really the expertise and uh, I think some of the partnerships that we have and the flat rates are obviously very key as well. Yeah, yeah. Definitely having somebody that's doing your uh, testing that has done it before just speeds everything up. So. That's definitely where we've we've seen we've made the most impact. Yeah. Good. I'll go to the next one. This is just around common workflows, Dave. If you wanna. Yeah. No in. problem. So some some of you may um, recognize some of these terms. Um, you know, they're they're really workflows, and I guess we would call them endpoints. Um, but on the workflow side, so when you're dealing with a trading partner. Um, a very common set of documents will be outlined in their implementation guide. So in this guide that has the schema and the different structure of how they'd like the data to be laid out, and then the different documents and what they're uh, required for, um, I would say the common ones are the 850. So that's the, that's the purchase order, right? That's something that, um, you know, all, if not, I would say most, if not all of our uh, integrations that we do include the 850. They really start with the 850. They start with the order. Um, the 860, which is like change order requests, right? Those are very popular. Uh, the 852, which is almost like a uh, like a product data set, right? So what they've done is they've they've clearly defined these document numbers, and they really are very common across all trading partners. And 850 is a purchase order across all trading partners. Um, those are common ones that we'll work with. 
Uh, and those are typically things that go into the ERP. So we would integrate that data from the trading partner into uh, the back end accounting package. And then common workflows that come out or common documents that come out would be things like invoices, which we would call an 810. Uh, or an 855, which is a purchase order acknowledgement, uh, and then shipping, you know, the ASN or the advanced shipping notices, the 856. So as you begin to, to work with um, EDI, you start to understand these document IDs, these document numbers and, and what, they, what they mean um, uh, at a certain level. So again, all of this information is in the implementation guide and the folks at eBridge that onboard this really kind of manage most of that stuff. So you don't have to be overwhelmed by this, but uh, certainly it's good information to know. Uh, endpoints, so really this would be the ERPs that we support, and you can see quite a list of them there. Really, on our side, there's probably 30 to 35 that we would support, and I would say like 15 of those would be very common, and we've got them listed here. So, uh, you know, SAP Business One, the dynamic suite of products, uh, all of the Sage products we support, uh, including Net, uh, NetSuite and Epicor. So there really isn't anything that we don't support or that we you know, don't have an option to support, uh, even if it's file integration and whatnot. So, um, and then on the trading partner side, these are probably North American uh, big box stores, but some of those names may be recognizable with Costco and Bed Bath and & Beyond and obviously Amazon, they do EDI as well. So uh, that's just a little snapshot of, of really the sort of the technical side of, of what you'll uh, see when you're required to do some of these things on the EDI side. That's great. And if, um, if you're curious, we have a very great big long list of all the trading partners we've worked with in the past. If you go to ebridgeconnections.com, in the top right corner, there's a button there that says start planning. And it'll take you to a way to see all of the, the trading partners we've we've engaged with before. Yeah, and I think it literally is thousands. It is, and it is. Yeah, and if you don't see uh, your trading partner on there or the big box store that you're maybe dealing with on there, um, you know, always put in the request because it's actually quite, quite easy to uh, to add if we have the implementation guide, which most of them do, we get that and we can add that to our platform, no problem. All right. All right, this is the, the fun part here. So um, one, of the, one of the things we wanted to touch on were, all right, so we've done EDI and commerce integrations for many, many years now. What are some of the things that we've seen people trip over uh, that we can warn you about <laughs> so that you don't make the, the same mistake. So uh, we sort of pooled pooled a, a group of people internally and some externally too and came up with sort of a, a fun list here. Wasn't fun at the time, but um, Dave, if you want to kind of go back and forth, I think that'll, that'll be a sure. nice way to do it. But the first one would be um, just get, instead of trying to boil the ocean or integrate every single thing you you have at your company, an idea would be, to pick pick one thing first. So that's the, the first bullet here, which is taking on too much at once is a common mistake. So we like to keep things simple. So we tell people get a blank piece of paper and a pen and draw what you have today. <clears throat> and then where are 80% of your troubles? They're likely with, with one or two trading partners or, or maybe you know one marketplace where most of your orders or most of the volumes are coming from. Let's start there because that'll make the most impact in the shortest amount of time. And then maybe a, a phase two or a phase three will be, you know, the next thing and the next thing. And so break it down into manageable pieces rather than trying to do everything at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great point, Lindsay. And it's something that's quite common, actually, when we, when we uh, have someone coming with multiple systems, they'll start with everything. And it is great to just sort of piecemeal it, start small and see some success and build on that. Uh, I think another, a, another real key point is um, having a, a point of contact uh, at, the, at the business, um, someone that we can ask questions to. As you can imagine, we're going to need to know where specific fields of data go from one system into another. And so they're, because we don't know the systems necessarily, we may be familiar with them, but they're, some of them can be customized, right, to uh, the business liking, obviously, uh, the way they need to run their business. And so having that point of contact is super key. It helps 
you know, A, keep the project flowing, and I think B, it just gets information, uh, you know, real detailed information into the hands of the professional service person that's, uh, that's onboarding it. So that's a, that's a super key one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Another one I wrote down here was um, identify what versions of software you're using and get um, access early to the people that are going to help with the integration. So uh, sometimes we come across customers that haven't quite finished setting up their Shopify store, let's say. And so it might be a little too early for them to then give us access to help begin the integration. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're ready to go, make sure your store is ready to go and get the access and we can onboard pretty quickly. And the other side of that is make sure you know what version of SAP Business One that you have, for example, because that, that could make a difference. There's lots of different uh, releases of, of ERP products. And so to know that will save some time uh, in the front. In the front. Yeah, great point, Lindsay. And I think the it sort of dovetails into the lack of information. So um, we have had um, times where we can be challenged if if all of the uh, let's call it homework is is not done, and somebody just says, "Ebridge here, you guys figure it out. You're the experts." Um, we probably could figure it out over time, but it it does go much more fluid when. Um, you're able to come prepared to, to, you know, to really say, okay, here's 80% of what we need to do. Here are the, you know, often when we're uh, engaged with the prospect, we'll have them walk through, the, we'll have them walk us through the manual process. And that really helps identify really where the workflows need to go and which ones are important. So that is an exercise that we do. But some, at, at sometimes people will say, well, what is the best practice or, you know, how should we be doing it? So it can be a flavor of both. But I find when people come prepared with what they would actually like, it does make for a, a much more, much more enjoyable, uh, you know, experience all the way through from start to finish. That's true. And it's it's important right at the beginning to have all of the people that have a stake in the project on a call or at least working or collaborating yes. on one single document so that, you know, a couple of weeks into the project, you realize, oh, you know what, this is not the owner of the project. <laughs> this person really is the one that needs to determine um, what information goes where and how it's set up. And then one, one fun one that I, I actually think it's kind of nerdy, but it's my favorite one is uh, there might be things in your current pro, uh, process that doesn't need to be taken into automation or integration. You know, maybe something that you've done all along, like uh, putting a piece of data into a certain field, now going to an integrated solution, you don't need to do anymore. So you can identify the things you absolutely need in an integration, and you can also flag some things that are you know, not necessary anymore because uh, maybe your process is maturing. And I think, uh, I'm just looking through, I think we cover them all, Dave. Did I miss any? No, I think that's a that's a pretty good that's a pretty good list, and those definitely would be the top. Let's call it four or five that uh, that are helpful um, good. in the process. Cool. All right, let's go to the next slide here. So this this is all about uh, what are the the steps or what is the flow once you decide yes we we need integration. Yeah, I think I think this is you know really just intended to to have you know the steps maybe a series of steps right and, and i think we tried to use some words to uh, describe what's happening but but really um we'll have people uh reach out to us they may find us through you know a google search uh maybe they're at an event or something or um you know they find us through uh through a partner which is very common either a web agency or a tech referral um they'll come to us and what our team is going to do is sit with them uh, understand their business and what is the what is the need? What are we trying to solve? What are we trying to help for? Um, we would design kind of what that looks like. And again, uh, design is a bit of a funny word, but it really could be us just sketching out on a piece of paper or using the blueprint builder uh, to pick the endpoints and get the different systems with the workflows. And then we will pass that to usually there's a sales engineer. Uh, involved and there is a ROM process where we start to look at all the different pieces, make sure that we understand 
exactly what's required by the customer. Uh, so there may be a couple of conversations that happen to make sure we have all of that information. And then once um, you know there's an ag agreement on on what needs to be done and the scope of work that will go over to our professional services team and then they really manage the the onboarding of the project so they'll work closely with the client and with the different team members that are involved to make sure that everything goes live properly and that all the different pieces of data are going into the uh to the right spots whether it's uh you know a trading partner or an ERP or a different marketplace or you know Shopify etc so um, it really is just those couple of steps and then often we'll have people that will come back and their plans for you know the remainder of 2021 or 22 are to uh, you know add more things and obviously we have a team that steps in and is able to to help with that and then the same process starts really over again, right? We make sure we design it and we make sure we get it over to uh, our service team and they deploy it, so. That's great. And this can happen, you know, pretty quickly depending on how uh, how organized and ready and how uh, complex or, or simple an integration is. So we've we've had some really quick kind of practical go lives uh, with, with customers all ready to go. One that comes to mind, uh, they had a spot on the shopping channel and um, they knew they were going to get a big influx of orders and we knew there was this deadline to hit that that TV spot time um, and, and we got it in with just a couple days. So uh, thanks, Dave. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And I think one one thing to, to point out that I probably didn't touch on is uh, in the specifically in the EDI deployment um, uh, phases, there's testing that has to happen with the trading partner. And the testing is a window that's set up by the trading partner. So they will select dates where, um, you know, you come, eBridge comes and we do the testing. So that is something that can impact uh, the onboarding of a trading partner. You're sort of at the mercy of their testing windows and you need to be at certain stages to be able to hit those testing windows. So that's just something that's important to to keep an eye out uh, for and to just pay attention to uh, something a little bit out of your control. But again, um, you know, it's something that uh, is required and there's a testing window that you need to go through, so. Great. All right. So that is the, 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 the end of the sort of formal presentation. And I know there's a few questions. Um, Andrew, I'm gonna toss it over to you. Andrew, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just uh, sorting out multiple screens. Apologies. Um, um, I think, Nicole, you were going to MC some of these questions, but... Yes, <clears throat> yes, we do have some questions um, so... from our audience today. Um, there's actually two at the moment. Um, so, Lindsay and, and Dave, can you please uh, address some of these questions here, which is, uh, how long does it take to get EDI integrated for a given trading partner? That's the first question. And the second is, what are some interesting trends in commerce right now? Okay. Yeah, I don't mind, Lindsay, I don't mind taking the first one. I know we, we touched on it a little bit. Um, but again, I think the, so, so here are a couple of things that may impact the the length of the onboarding right so um uh you know i'll use costco as an example so costco will have a bunch of different they, there's costco us costco canada um there's all these different sort of uh divisions i guess of costco if you're to onboard each of those divisions then you may have say four testing uh windows that you need to go through right so um, another variable that can, you know, make the, the, the onboarding go a little lengthier or a little longer is these testing scenarios. Sometimes what trading partners will do is they want you to test for maybe 20 or 30 different scenarios. So they'll have um, a, a sort of a work kit or a workbook that you go through and you need to make sure that all of these testing scenarios uh, with data missing, right, might be dates missing, it might be cartons, it might be different um, um, sort of nuances with the data, we have to test against all of that. So when you get into those complex scenarios, 
you can imagine the window can sometimes go into weeks or even months, right? Um, I would say most common is, you know, you're dealing with one trading partner, one division, and you're maybe dealing with two scenarios. So that's very common. And that can typically take, if we're involved with the customer closely, um, you know, and we have everything we need and the testing window is set up fairly quickly, uh, it really can take a couple of weeks. So um, I'd hate to maybe just average a, a like a ballpark or something or throw a ballpark out there. But I would say in my experience, it can be a couple of weeks uh, to have these onboarded. Great. That was great, that Dave. Helps. I have nothing to add. You said it perfectly. Um, that second question that you asked, uh, Nicole, I think it was around just other trends in commerce. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, definitely, you know, you know, we, we have a pulse on what's going on kind of across the globe. And, uh, one of the, the cool or interesting trends is that, um, just what we've been talking about e-commerce, uh, not only are people trying to jump on to e-commerce, but they're also discovering that they need to do EDI with trading partners, even if it's drop ship. Um, and oftentimes they'll have to do EDI with Amazon which we won't even get into, but there are some uh, definite rules with, with Amazon as well. Um, so just, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, multiple channels um, that folks need to sell across. And these are all to do with commerce, digital commerce. And so it can get really complex as you're growing. Uh, so that's, that's a trend. Uh, and then because of that, trend two is people are looking for integration. Uh, they realize that this can't happen manually. Uh, it can't happen because there's um, sort of laws you have to abide by, by in order to, to stay uh, selling on, on these marketplaces or to these retailers. And also just keeping up with customer expectations. If you're slow, if you're not shipping the right product, you're going to get a bad review. You're going to have uh, trouble getting net new customers. So that's trend two. Um, trend three, there, there's a lot of cool and interesting things happening out there. Um, one of them is this, all of these um, sort of after pay or affirm or sezzle. It's sort of that buy now, pay later trend that's happening, which I, I find pretty interesting. Um, another one is just how are people saving money or being efficient with shipping? And so over in North America, we have a, a bunch of 3PLs. Um, and I know obviously over uh, in, in Asia Pack as well. So DHL, uh, there's a bunch. ShipStation is popular in North America. But, you know, how to navigate the complexity of figuring out how to get your package to your customer in the cheapest and fastest way um, is something that uh, is, is exploding as a topic in, in commerce today. And then the last bit is just B2B. Um, so traditionally, selling online would be to customers. Um, but now businesses that sell to other businesses are, are figuring out that they need an online presence too. Uh, so that would be another trend. Dave, yeah, did I, I think, miss any? I think there, there's, th that was a great list. I think there's uh, one other thing that I've noticed over the last, I'll call it like probably three years, two or three years, that's really creeping up into the scope of the things that we're doing. And uh, it's, I don't know if they call it on logistics or something i've I heard that word but it's returns and it's managing returns that has been something that's come up uh you know not on every job but pretty close uh on every integration we're really talking about how to handle returns how do they make it easy for the customer to return what they purchased and and that's also a, a quite a big market and and that's something that uh, uh has been trending for sure over the last uh, two three years so Just got another question here, uh, probably best for you, Dave, just on how does um, eBridge actually work uh, with Jitterbit? Um, in, in, in which approach, uh, Andrew, just? Uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming it means we've, we've got existing customers on the call who are, who are users of the platform. Now gotcha. adding eBridge mix, how do they actually talk? Uh, gotcha. Um, yeah, I mean that's a that's a that's a really great question. Um, right now, Mike and I are, you know, Mike's the VP of Sales at, at Jitterbit, and really we are um, 
I wouldn't even say exploring ways because we're kind of down a path already where uh, there are certain eBridge customers that are maybe um, limited by the things we're able to do, and we're able to pull some jitterbit tech into the things that we that they'd like to do. And I also see the reverse happening where we maybe have some jitterbit com uh, customers that are able to leverage uh, some of the the uh, eBridge tech. So um, I, I really see this as like a good, a really good alignment of not only different technologies, but I think because we are in different spaces in the market, um, that we're not really colliding into each other. We're really complementing each other. So I don't know if that, helps answer, answer the questions uh, question, but I feel like we're early days of really overlapping two really great platforms to pull the best of both things. And obviously tonight you can see with the EDI piece, that's gonna be something that's really fantastic to, to bring to the region here. So I hope that helps answer the question. Thanks, Dave. I think, um, you know, there's, it's always good just to tell a little story. I know we've got uh, about five minutes left, but. Um, one of the things that you know I quite enjoy doing is talking to customers about the before and the after. Have you got an example that you can share with the audience where pre eBridge slash Jitterbit have come in and what their processes were and, and, and the efficiencies or inefficiencies versus post? Yeah, great question. Lindsay, I don't know if you have, do you have, because um, I know you've dealt with some of the bigger customers um, after we've mm -hmm. onboarded them. Do you? Do you have one that comes to mind? I do. I have a few. One of them, um, I, I won't say the company name, but uh, it, it's a Canadian company. And they uh, uh, they have a business and they, it, it was obviously, it was a small business that just all of a sudden started booming. And um, the owner is female and she would take her kids into the warehouse to try and keep up with orders on the weekends and try to comply with these EDI regulations. And so that was not working. Um, so it was just, it was cool to see that technology can change somebody's life and let them grow their business and take on new trading partners and sell online without having to, you know, worry about paper orders in a warehouse on a Saturday morning. So that, that, that example to me, just, it changed, changed somebody's life. So that was pretty cool. I, um, and then, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, you know what? I was just thinking, Lindsay, of comfort research, um, yes. the, yep a big bean bag company, uh, Andrew, that we deal with. And um, we, we went on site and the challenge was they, what, they would run an ad either in say a Walmart flyer or they would run something for Black Friday, Cyber Monday on Amazon. And you would think these are just bean bags. Well, as they got into uh, the university uh, coming back, uh, schools, you know, dorms filling up, people would be buying these bean bags and the, the sort of bean bag type furniture which they supplied. And they would do about 800 orders in a minute. And the product that they were using at the time could not throttle fast enough. It would get bogged down and they would end up having this batch of orders that was, it would be sometimes a week long and they would start to lose status on Amazon. And it was a bit of a disaster. Uh, we went on site we did a demo for them and we showed them that we could do the throttle of 800, 1,000 plus in a minute uh, and, and get this into their, their great planes at the, the ERP. And so going on site, uh, walking through the factory and watching how these bean bags were made and how they were sort of made on demand because they would inflate the little rice beans and put them in the bag pretty much when the order came in. So it was imperative that they didn't build up this big inventory of bean bags. They really had to be made, assembled, and put on the truck and gone. So it had to be very efficient. And it was not efficient in the current process and product they were using. We came in, we onboarded, oh, I'm gonna say probably, Lindsay, probably 40 or 50 trading partners, I think. Oh. It was a lot. And they're a really great customer uh, of Jitterbit and eBridge right now. And, and I would say that's an example, Andrew, where it was sort of chaos and, you know, now it's, you know, streamlined and uh, a lot of those disadvantages and troubles that they had um, have been have been sort of taken away. So I hope that helps paint a little bit of a picture. Good story. Thanks, Dave. I think um, we've only got 30, 30 odd seconds left. What I'd like to just remind people, 
if you are in a position to reach out, if you need any further information on both eBridge or Jitterbit, to contact us at uh, salesau um, at jitterbit.com. Alternatively, um, info at jitterbit.com will, will make its way to us here as well. Um, I want to thank everyone for their time today. I know um, it's a bit hard scheduling Canada with India and, and New Zealand, and, and uh, I do appreciate people taking time out to learn a bit about what it is we're doing here. I have to say I'm pretty excited. We've got a real sweet spot in this market around supply chain manufacturing and retail, and it fits really, really well with what some of our customers are looking to do. Um, and in that mid-market space, we tend to be more innovative, I think, than in the enterprise. So. Um, please feel free to ask any questions. We'd love to be able to help streamline processes in your business. Um, that, that all said, um, I believe there is some sort of prize that will be drawn and we'll notify the winners of that prize as a result of this webinar today. And I want to thank everyone for their time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.